sometimes in the evening after John Fung had had his bath. I'd wash his robes. I'd go up to his porch and have a cup of tea before I headed up to the top of the hill. Especially in the beginning months when I was there with him. He would give a Dharma talk. Sometimes the talk would be quite long. I didn't appreciate it at the time how rare that was. Because in later years he tended to be a man of few words. But those first couple of months, I guess, he decided he wanted to give me an education. Sometimes he tells stories. Sometimes it'd be about his times with the John Lee. Sometimes about his own experiences going off Tudong. Other times just stories about other people, sometimes from the Jatakas, sometimes incidents that he had heard about. And there was a certain flavor to the stories that he liked. One had to do with Sam Deto. You may have noticed that statue that we have over there in the, in the shrines. He was a famous monk in the 19th century. He had been the teacher of Rama IV when Rama IV was a young monk, and then had gone off into the woods. And years later, when the young monk became Rama IV, he set out search parties to find Somdet Do, made him a Somdet, across the river from the palace. And you can imagine the word got out that this was the teacher of the king, and so a lot of high-ranking people would come to see him. In the mornings, he would eat his meal in a little pavilion in front of his hut, and he would throw food to the dogs, which meant that every time he sat down to his meal, a lot of the dogs would come thronging around, which meant that all the high-ranking people in Bangkok who wanted to see Somdetto at that time came to bow down to him. They had to bow down to the dogs as well. And that was his test. If people were not willing to bow down to the dogs, he wouldn't, didn't want to talk to them. And John Fung liked that story. Another one he liked was actually one that's in the Jatakas, about an Arand, who was a very quiet man, staying in a monastery near the capital. Word got to the king that this monk was an Arand, and the king was not all that sure about it, but people said that he was a monk worthy of respect, so he was going to go visit him. And the, the monks in the monastery told the Arahant, okay, the king is going to come, try to make a good impression. He'll support the monastery. And the Arahant said, okay, you can put your minds at rest. So the king came to see him, and he didn't pay any attention to the king at all. He just sat there with a stick in his hand, drawing little designs in the, in the dust. The king got offended, left. The monks were upset. And again he said, put your mind to rest. This is between me and the king. Not too long after that, the Arahant died, and his corpse displayed all kinds of miracles. Rainbows were coming out of it, and shoots of water, lights, and that kind of stuff. This time the king was really impressed. Came and he Give a lot of support to the monastery. Again, that was another story that a John Fung really liked. You get the you get the picture. He tended to stay away from high-ranking people. He was something of a maverick, but he was extremely loyal to John Lee. He had one teacher. I mean, he had been with the John Mun, I respected the John Mun greatly. But as he said, he never felt really comfortable around the John Mun. Either he'd, be, he'd act too confident or be too afraid. One conversation he recounted, again with the John Mun, in the evening after he'd had his bath, the monks would go up to the porch of his hut, and he would give them a little Dharma talk before sending them off to meditate on their own. And it so happened that one evening after the bath, and John Fung went up to the porch, and he was the only monk there. The other monks had other things that they had to do. And John Mun gave a long talk on Buddha relics, different colors, different shapes, which part of the body they would come from, 
depending on the shape and the color. And all that John Funk could think about was, how does he know I have relics in my, my shoulder bag? Then years later, when he was involved in the, the Jedi of Watasukaram, and then again the Jedi of Watamasid, it had to do with lots of relics. And he suddenly realized, oh, this is what a John Mun foresaw, that he'd be the gatherer of the relics for those, for those monuments. But with the John Lee, there was a strong sense of trust, a strong sense of rapport. He was afraid of John Lee, but also felt a lot of confidence around him. He told the story of they're going on Tudong one time with a group of other monks. And he learned pretty quickly with John Lee that if you're going through the forest with the John Lee, the John Lee's going to walk really fast, and you've got to keep up with him. So he did. And the evening came, and it turned out that he and John Lee were on this hilltop, and there's nobody else. Nobody else had been able to keep up with the pace. Well, somebody else had a John Lee's bowl, and somebody else had a John Lee's umbrella tent. So they had to share the umbrella tent that night, a John Fung's umbrella tent. They gave a John Lee a little massage on his legs, and then sat and meditated for a while. And as he said, he thought of that line in the canon. It talks about the monk who's content with his belongings, who wherever he goes has only his bowl and his robes. Just as a bird, wherever it goes, has only its wings as its burden. In the same way, the monk has the robes as his only burden. Another time they were at Wadasokaram near Bangkok, and they were going to go on Tudong. This time, lay people were going to go along as well. And so a John Fuang packed a very small shoulder bag with his bowl. They showed up at the, the train station. They were going to go up to Lopuri, and then from Lopuri they were going to go into the woods. And they showed up at the train station, and all the lay people had two or three bags, thinking that when they got to Lopuri they'd be able to hire, hire porters to carry the bags for them into the woods. Well, John Lee saw the burdens that everybody had, and so instead of getting on the train, he just walked along the railroad track. Now, when they, John walks along the railroad track, everybody has to walk along the railroad track. And a lot of people were struggling with their luggage, and they complained. And the rest of John Lee didn't say anything. He just kept on walking. Finally, said, "Well, if it's heavy, throw it away. Let go of it." So everybody had to stop, sort through their luggage, take only what was necessary, pack one bag apiece. And as for everything else, it turns out that back in those days they had lotus ponds on the side of the railroad. So everything got thrown into lotus ponds. And they continued walking up to Samsane, which was the next station, a mile or two down the way. And when John Lee saw that everybody's load was the right size, okay, then they got on the train. So these are some of the stories that John Fuang would tell. It gives you a good idea of the forest tradition. One, not caring that much about the status of people in the world. Even though John Lee had a lot of people of very high status, John Fuang, after John Lee passed away, was invited into Wamakut by the Supreme Patriarch at the time. And you can imagine the people who come to see the Supreme Patriarch. And the Supreme Patriarch said, well, if you're interested in meditation, go see John Fuang. So I had to deal with a lot of high-ranking people with a lot of pride. So I can see why that story about some dead toe with the dogs appealed to him. And also the lessons of Tudong. Try to live as spare a life as possible. Spare not only in the sense of the things you have with you, but your entanglement with other people. He told an interesting story one time. He was staying in the woods with one other monk. And in the morning they went for alms. And one of the people who put bowls in the excuse me, put food in their bowls, asked the other monk a question. I don't know what the question was, but John Fung said, it was the kind of question that you didn't have to answer. But the other monk answered anyhow. They got back to their spot, they had their meals, and later in the day the monk had a bad the other monk had a bad case of dysentery. 
and John Fung attributed it to the fact that he had spoken when he didn't have to. As he said, when you go into the forest, the forest is the bigger John. And it's watching you all the time. His first time on his Tudong up in the north, after staying with John Mun, he went to this one spot. And as he said, when you go to a new spot, you meditate late at night, get up early in the morning, really behave yourself, because you don't know who's watching. So for the first couple of days, that's what he did. Then about the third or fourth day, he thought to himself, hmm, there's probably nobody here. He decided to go to bed a little bit earlier that night. And as soon as he put his head on the pillow, this voice appeared in his ear and says, Go, you're not welcome here. The forest is that demanding. So think about that as a practice. Have the sense that there's somebody watching you. What are they going to watch? You want to behave in a way that's something you would be proud to have other people see. I know I certainly had that sense of what I must have did in the early years when it was really way out of the way. I was being watched all the time. And on top of that, of course, there was a sense that a giant phone could read my mind. So you have to behave yourself all the time, each breath, each movement. But as I told myself, well, I came here for a training, and this is it. That's the kind of training you get when you stay in the woods, especially in a place like Thailand, where the spirits know the, the monks' rules. And they watch you. There's that famous story in the Ajahn Mun biography, where he goes and stays in a cave, and there's a Naga watching him all the time. And finally appears to Ajahn Mun. It says, I've been watching you, and unlike other monks, you actually hold by the vinaya. And so John Mun was able to teach him. So have a sense that you're being watched. Live frugally. Speak frugally. The more careful you are with your mouth, the more value your words will have. Remember one time early on in my stay there. There was another young monk and I were talking about Dharma. And I happened to say something, he said, I think it's like this. And John Fung happened to be walking past, he heard me say that. He said, if you don't know, why are you saying anything? Every time you open your mouth, ask yourself, is this necessary? If not, why say it? If you can't control your mouth, how are you going to control your mind? So those are some of the lessons you learn when you're really serious about the practice. You think about that story in the canon where a monk goes down into a, a pond of water, and there's a lotus in the pond. He bends over to sniff the scent of the lotus, and a dave immediately appears and says, You just stole that scent. And the monk says, Oh, come on. There's no precept against that. And the dave said, Someone who's really serious about the practice should see even the slightest fault, as huge as a cloud. You think back in those days, the biggest thing you can think of would be the sky, right? And one even bigger than the sky are clouds that cover the sky. So even the slightest fault is bigger than a cloud. Well, the monk came to his senses, thanked the deva, and then said, if you see me do anything else like that, please let me know. And the Deva said, look, what you do is your business, I'm not your servant, and disappeared. <laughs>